Welcome, welcome. All right. All right, we got a few people here. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm just gonna give it a minute or two and then we will, we will jump into our reading for today. Okay. Thank you to who's here. Hi, Emily. Thanks for joining us today. When do we start? Ooh, okay. Welcome, everyone. Hi, boo. <laughs> All right. I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. And as folks come in, they can come in. But uh, welcome, everybody. So um, this is the second installment out of a 25-part series that we are doing at the Emily Taylor Center for Women and Gender Equity and with the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Um, this is the uh, free Black Women's Reading Challenge that we're doing. Um, and my name, who am I gonna be reading today? Uh, my name is Rin Julie, um, Rin Julie Fruster. I use they, them, theirs for my pronouns. Um, and I am the program coordinator for the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Um, I do the social justice and the diversity education there. Um, in addition to those roles, um, I identify as a queer, uh, biracial, Black, and Afro-Latina um, bruja, uh, femme person, um, and as a healer, somebody who is healing myself and trying to heal the world around me. Um, yeah, so today, um, everyone who's going to be reading this week for you is going to be choosing a different book. Um, today, I chose uh, The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, I love this book. It talks about radical self-love, and it's not so much as a self-help book where it tells you what to do as a book that really engages its readers and audience in critical questions of reflection and um, self-honesty with ourselves. Uh, so uh, without further ado, um, as you can see, I'm very excited. <laughs> um, so I have some excerpts that I'm going to read from the book with y'all today. Um, and if you see below in the comments, uh, Boo Long and Meg Williams are here. Um, one of you lucky participants is going to get a free copy today. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. So The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love by Sonia Renee Taylor. And before the book even begins, before we jump into the prologue or the chapters, um, there is a poem in here at the front. Um, and it's dedicated to uh, Sonia's mother, uh, Terry Lynn Hines, who died in 2012. And it's titled, My Mother's Belly. Um, I loved this poem, it made me think of my mom, so I wanted to start it off with y'all. Um, my Mother's Belly. The bread of her waist, a loaf, I would knead with eight-year-old palms, sweaty from play. My brother and I marveled at the ridges and grooves, how they would summit at her navel, how her belly looked like a walnut, where we once were seeds that res resided inside. We giggled, my brother and I, when she would recline on the couch, lift her shirt and let her belly spread like cake batter in a pan. It is as much a treat as licking the sweet from the electric mixers on birthdays. The undulating of my mother's belly was not shame she hid from her children. She knew we came from this. Her belly was a gift. We kept passing between us. It was both hers of her body and ours for having made it new and different. Her belly was an altar of flesh built in membranes of us by us. What remains of my mother's belly resides in a container of ashes I keep in a closet. Every once and again, I open the box, sift through the fine crystals with palms that were once eight, feel the grooves and ridges that do, now, that do not summit now, but whirl through fingers. Granule so much more salt than sweet today. And yet still I marvel at her body, at once body. Even in this form, say I came from this. So that was my mother's belly. 
Um, so I'm going to be jumping around a little bit for y'all um, through the prologue, throughout the different chapters. Um, and thank you again for being with me. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right ahead into the prologue. All right. Long before there was a digital media, an education company, or a radical self-love movement with hundreds of thousands of followers on our website and social media pages, before anyone cared to write about us in newsprint or interview me on television, before people began to send me photos of their bodies with my words etched into their backs, forearms, and shoulders, there was a word, well, words. Those words were your body is not an apology. It was the summer of 2010 in a hotel room in Knoxville, Tennessee. My team and I were preparing for an evening bouts of competition at the Southern Fry Poetry Slam. Slam is a competitive performance poetry. Teams and individuals get three minutes on stage to share what is often deeply intimate, personal and political poetry at which point five randomly selected judges from the audience score their poems on a scale from zero to 10. It's a ruckus game that takes high art of poetry and brings it to the masses in bars, clubs, coffee shops, and National Poetry Slam championship tournaments around the country. Poetry slams are ridiculous as it is beautiful. It is everything gauche and glorious about power of the word. The slam is this place where the misfits and marginalized, and sometimes self-absorbed, have center stage in the rapt ears of the audience, if only for three minutes. It was on a hotel bed in this city, preparing for this odd game, that I uttered the words, your body is not an apology, for the first time. My team was a kaleidoscope of bodies and identities. We were a microism of the world that I like to live in. We were black, white, and Southeast Asian. We were able-bodied and disabled. We were gay, straight, bi, and queer. What we brought to Knoxville that year were stories of living in our bodies in their complex tapestries. We were complicated and honest with each other, and this is how I wound up in a conversation with my teammate Natasha, an early 30-something-year-old with cerebral palsy and fearful that she might be pregnant. Natasha told me that her potential pregnancy was most assuredly by a guy who she had an occasional fling. All of life was up in the air for Natasha, but she knew was abundantly clear that she had no desire to have a baby and not by this person. One of my many career iterations in the past was a sexual health and public health service provider. This background made me notorious for asking people about their sexual safe practices, handing out condoms, and offering sexual health harm reduction strategies. Instinctually, I asked Natasha why she had chosen not to use a condom with this casual partner with whom she had no interest in procreating. Neither Natasha nor I knew that my honest question and her honest answer would be the catalyst for an entire movement. Natasha told me her truth. My disability makes sex really hard with positioning and stuff. I just didn't feel like it was okay to make a big deal about using condoms. When we hear someone's truth, it strikes some deep part of our humanity, our own hidden shames. It can be easily to recoil into silence. We struggle to hold the truths of others because we have so rarely had the experience of having our own truths held and seen. Social researchers and experts on vulnerability and shame, Brene Brown says, quote, if we can share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive, end quote. I understood the truth Natasha was sharing. Her words pricked some painful underbelly of knowing in my body. My entire being rang in resonance. I was transported to all the times I'd given away my body in penance. A reel of memory scrolled through my mind of all the ways I told the world I was sorry for having this body, a bad body. It was from deep, it was from the deep cave of mutual vulnerability the world spilled for me. Natasha, your body is not an apology. It is something you give to someone. It is not something you give to someone and say, I'm sorry for my disability. She began to weep and for a few minutes I held my pregnant friend as she, com as she contemplated the fullness of what those words meant in her life and her body. There are times when our unflinching honesty, vulnerability, and empathy will create a transformative portal, an opening to a completely new way of living. Such a portal was created between Natasha and me the sum that summer evening in Tennessee, because as the words escaped my lips, part of them remained stuck inside of me. 
The words I said to Natasha in that hotel room were as much for me as they were for her. I will also be telling, I was also telling myself, Sonia, your body is not an apology. And that's our prologue. Um, I was almost gonna apologize for stuttering over my words, but uh, this doesn't feel like the place. So thank you for your grace. Um, so I'm gonna jump real quick to a passage in chapter four. Um, a new way ordered by love. A world of all bodies is a world for our bodies. Perhaps you have missed it this far, but I have an agenda to which I am obnoxiously wedded. It's a simple agenda. I want to change the world by convincing you to love every facet of yourself radically and unapologetically, even in the parts of you that you don't like. And though this work illustrates, and through this work illustrates for you how radical love alters our planet. Radical self-love is an internal process offering external transformation. How we show up to life reflects how we show up to ourselves. When we strip away the veneer of self-reliance and individualism and allow ourselves access to the most vulnerable truths, we can't help the heartbeat present to the fact that our relationship to, with other bodies mirrors in tangible ways our relationship with our own. Yes, we have been cutting and cruel to ourselves and have watched our internalized shame spill over into how we parent, how we manage employees, how we show up for our friends and family. Yes, we believed that our bodies were too big, too dark, too pale, too scared, too ugly. So we tucked and folded and hid ourselves away from the world and wondered why our lives looked so infinitely smaller than what we knew we were capable of. Yes, we have the less, yes, we have been less vibrant employees, less compassionate neighbors, less tolerant of bodies of others, not because they are bad people, but because we are guilty of each of those counts against ourselves. Our lens to the outside world is an interior lens projecting our experience in our bodies onto the external landscape. A shame clouded by interior, a uh, clouded interior lens can only project shame and judgment. Employing a radical self-love ethos is like squirting Windex on our daily lives. Suddenly, we can see ourselves as employees or employers, as parents, as friends, as neighbors and community members, as leaders, thinkers, doers, as humans, distinctively connected to other humans. Applying radical self-love to each facet of those roles and responsibilities alters the very fabric of humanity, ultimately creating a more just, equitable, and compassionate world. Beautiful, right? All right, so now I'm gonna take you to chapter one. I feel almost guilty reading it all for you because I want y'all to come and read this yourselves. So let's start with chapter one, making self-love radical. What radical self-love is and what it ain't. Let me answer a couple questions right away before you dig too deeply into this book and are left feeling bamboozled and hoodwinked. First, will this book fix my self-esteem? No. <laughs> Second, will this book teach me how to have self-confidence? Nah. And an impromptu third question, then why in the hell am I reading this book? You're reading this book because you, your heart is calling you towards something exponentially more magnus and more succulent than self-esteem or self-confidence. You are being called towards radical self-love. While not completely unrelated to self-esteem or self-confidence, radical self-love is its own entity, a lush and verdant island offering safe harbor for self-esteem and self-confidence. Unfortunately, those two ships often choose to wander aimlessly adrift at sea, relying on willpower or ego to drive them and in the absence of those two motors are left hopelessly pursuing the fraught and mirage of someday. As in, someday I'll feel good enough about myself to shop that screenplay. Or someday, when I have self-confidence, I'll get out of this raggedy relationship. Self-esteem and self-confidence are fleeting and both exist without radical self-love, but it's almost never bodes well for anybody involved when they do. Think about all the obnoxious people you know oozing arrogance, folks that can be certain think extremely high of themselves, although you may call them confident. I bet the phrase radical self-love doesn't quite fit. 
Pick your favorite Tolterian dictator, and you will likely find someone who has done just fine with self-confidence. After all, you would think that you are the bee's knees if you had to entertain the idea of single-handedly dominating the entire planet. The 45th president strikes me as a man with epic self-confidence. He's not struggling with his sense of self, even though the rest of the world is. <laughs> and even, with, even if we were to summarize that Trump and all others like him acting from exaggerated lack of self-esteem or confidence, I think we can agree that much of their attitudes or actions less don't feel like love. You may be asking, okay, so if this book won't help me with self-esteem or confidence, will it at least teach me about self-acceptance? My short answer is, if I do my job correctly, no. Not because self-acceptance isn't useful, but because I believe there is a port far beyond the aisle of self-acceptance and I want us all to go there. Think back to the times you accepted and found it completely uninspiring. When I was a kid, my mother would, would make me and my brother frozen pot pies for dinner. It was the meal for the day she didn't feel like cooking, and I enjoyed the flaky crust, the chunks of mechanically pressed chicken and bandai colored beige gravy were tolerable, but there was nothing less appetizing than the vegetable medley of peas, green beans, and carrots portioned through each bite like miserable stars in an endless galaxy. Yes, I ate those hateful mixed vegetables. Hunger will make you accept things. I accept that my options were limited. Pick out a million tiny peas or get a job at the age of 10 and learn how to feed myself. But why am I talking about pot pies? Because self-acceptance is the mixed veggie pot pie of radical self-love. It will keep you alive when the options are sparse, but what if there is a life beyond frozen pot pies? Too often, self-acceptance is used as a synonym for acquiescence. We accept things that we cannot change. We accept death because we have no say over its arbitrary and indifferent arrival at our door. We have personal histories of bland acceptance. We have accepted lackluster jobs because we were broke. We have accepted lousy partners because their lousy presence was better than the hollow aloneness of their absence. We practice self-acceptance when we have grown tired of self-hatred, but, um, but can't be convinced of anything beyond a paltry tolerance of ourselves. With a thin coat to wear in this weather-tossed road. Famed activist and professor Angela Davis said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. I wanna read that again. I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I can no longer accept. When we change the, the circumstances that have us settled for self-acceptance, I assure you there is a richer, thicker, cozier blanket to carry you through this world. There is a realm that is infinitely more mind-blowing and it is called radical self-love. So why must it be radical? I love this part. Um, all right, Sonia, I get it. Loving ourselves is important, but why do we have to be all radical about it? To answer this question is to further distinguish radical self-love from its fickle cousins, self-confidence and self-esteem, or its scrappy kid self sister, self-acceptance. It requires that we explore the definition of the word radical. Language is fluid and evolutionary, regularly leaving the dictionary definitions feeling dated and sorely lacking the nuance. How we construct language is an enormous part of how we understand and judge bodies. The definition of radical is a powerful, is a powerful one we explore its relationship to self-love. The dictionary defines radical as one, of or the ongoing root or origin, fundamental, a radical difference. Two, thorough, ongoing, or extreme, especially as regards to change from accepted or traditional forms, a radical change in policy or a company. Three, favoring drastic political, economic, or social reforms, radical ideas, radical anti uh, anarchist ideologies. Four, forming a basis or foundation, and five, existing inherently in a thing or person, radical defects, defects of character. 
So radical really being this idea of root, this sense of origin, this thorough part of self. That was me, not the book. So radical self-love is deeper, wider, and more expansive than anything we could call self-consonance or self-esteem. It's juicier than self-acceptance, including the word radical, offers us a self-love that is the root or origin to our relationship to ourselves. We did not start life in a negative partnership with our bodies. I have never seen a toddler lament the size of their thighs or the squishiness of their bellies. Children do not arrive here ashamed of their race, gender, age, or disabilities. Babies love their bodies. Each discovery they encounter is awesome. Have you ever seen a baby realize that they have feet? Wonder. What is the, that is the unobstructed relationship with, with our bodies and what that looks like. You were an infant once, which means that there was a time where you thought your body was awesome. Connecting to that memory may feel as distant as the furthest star. It may not even be a memory you can access at all, but just knowing that there was a point in history where you once loved your body can be a reminder that body shame is fantastically in crappy inheritance. We, did not give our, we didn't give it to ourselves. We are not obligated to keep it. We arrived on this planet as love. I love that. These are things that we can unlearn. Okay. I'm going to jump into chapter two with y'all. Just give you a little taste of everything. Uh, so shame, chapter two. Shame, guilt, and apology. Then and now. When did we learn to hate them? Keisha has bald spots, was the consistent choral offering of Keisha's brief bus ride to Wolsler Elementary School. The teasing was brutal and regular, but in some ways the daily routine made it easier to adapt to. Keisha's mama had a pennant for gorgeous labyrinth braided hairstyles. Her mother, her mother also had the grip of an X-Men character, and by the time Keisha was in third grade, those tight braids had ripped her hair right out, the right out of her nine-year-old scalp, causing permanent bald spots on both sides of her head, a condition known as traction alplasia. Being different is difficult in a world that tells us that there is a normal. Many of us have orient of oriented our entire lives around this effort to be normal, never realizing that normal is not a stationary goal. It keeps moving while we dance a perpetual fox trot and jitter bug around it, trying to catch up and confused when we finish the day, exhausted and uninspired by this party called life. It is considered normal for women and girls in the United States to have hair, a reality shaped by varying degrees by the default of Western beauty standards. In Western societies, hair is often tied to notions of femininity, beauty, and gender. Having hair is what we expect of a normal woman or girl. Of course, there are endless screeds to rules of governing of notions of normal hair. One cannot have too much hair or too little. Hair can only be in certain places on our bodies, and hair should have a certain texture and should be a certain color. For Americans, the rule of hair, like for most body rules, comes with a default aesthetic. It should be long, straight, fine, and if possible, blonde. <laughs> um, <laughs> Even before children on sc the school bus began singing, Keisha has bald spots, it was likely that Keisha already knew she did not fit the default of normal hair. Commercials would have told her, music would have said it, pictures in her school books would have made it very clear that Keisha's hair was not the default. Her short, dark, kinky hair and soon to be partially bald head would never be the default and by extension, never be normal. In a soci our society, normal is the pathway to being worthy and beautiful. I giggle because I have a lot of things with my hair. Um, body shame origin stories. If I asked you to recall your first memory of body shame, it's likely that your story, like Keisha's, would have had at least one of the following elements. Developed in your youth, is a response to a rapid and unexpected body change. It occurred when you became aware of difference. It led you to assume that there was some should about your body. It was reflected or reinforced by familial, social, cultural, and political messages. 
or maybe it was attached to a story or belief about your value or worth in the world. Having traveled the country and listened to thousands of body shame stories, I observed patterns about how power indoctrination into body shame shares some very key characteristics. For many of us, our first shame memory occurs when we enter our teenage years. It is unsurprisingly that early on we internalize these negative messages. Being young and practically, particularly impressionable, we take cues from the external world on how we are, who we are and who we should be. In childhood, when we are highly impressionable and there is an inf infancy of developing a sense of individual, individualization and identity, it is no surprise that the early seeds of body shame might begin to take root. A Yahoo Health survey of 1,993 teens and adults uh, respondents found that the average age of body shame consciousness was between the age of 13 and 14. Additionally, it found that the re recipients um, were experiencing body shame at increasingly younger ages as beginning at early at the ages of nine and 10. In this workshop on radical self-love offered by The Body is Not an Apology, participants are asked to share their earliest memories of body shame, and here are some of the responses. I was around seven years old when a little boy in school named James called me fat. I think it was then when I started dieting, Kathleen. At about age seven, my older brother or a friend told me of a friend told me girls couldn't go topless because it was dirty, Emma. And the last one, I was four years old, my first day at daycare, when a little boy told me I looked like a bulldog, Amy. For Amy, Kathleen, and Emma, and Keisha, those early, those early messages stuck with them and shaped their sense of worth and value. The messages altered how they felt about their bodies. And girls are by no means the only ones receiving these de uh, detrimental messages. Boys, trans children, and gender non-conforming children receive similar same shaming messages in their early years. Some more examples. I was 12 years old when my basketball teammates and I were changing in the locker room. One of the kids called me chicken chest because I was so skinny and my team made clucking noise at me for the rest of the season, David. From age six, I knew I felt like a boy. I hated the dresses and dolls my mother would force on me. Whether I, whenever I complained, she would tell me that as long as she bought the clothes, I would wear what she told me to. I learned quickly that who I was was not okay. And then unapologetic inquiry. What are your early memories, earliest memories of body shame? How is it similar or different to the stories shared here? So throughout the book, um, Sonia does a great way of making you pause and reflect with some journal entries. Um, I know for me, I think my earliest memory of body shaming, I was six years old at an all white daycare um, and they had never seen an Afro before. Okay. Another unapologetic inquiry. So welcome to folks who um, are just joining us. I'm reading you some excerpts from The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. All right, so another unapologetic inquiry for y'all. When was the first time that you noticed that you or someone else was different? What did that make, what did that, what did you make that difference mean about you? And what did you make that difference mean about them? A year or so ago, a woman in one of my workshops shared that as a dark-skinned black ballerina, she felt from early in her training as if someone th something was holding her back. Eventually, she included, concluded that it was the color of her skin. What might make this young woman feel as if her blackness was a disadvantage in her pursuits of classical dancing? Consider this hypothesis. When we don't see ourselves reflected in the world around us, we make judgment about the absence. Invisibility is a statement. Again, when we don't see ourselves reflected in the world around us, we make judgments about the absence. Invisibility is a statement. It says something about the world and our place in it. In a 2014 study done in collaboration with David Brander Research and MTV, found that among millennials, 73%, that's three quarters of us, responded and believed that never considering race would improve society. Unfortunately, despite our dreams of a utopic colorblind planet, this thinking only functions to reinforce body shame. How many times have we heard the following statement? I don't see color. Although it's well-intentioned, 
not seeing color is ultimately a reflection of our personal challenges around navigating difference. We may be trying to convey that we don't judge people based on racial identity, but being colorblind is an act of erasure. Not only does it make invisible all the experiences a person has had that is shaped, their, that is shaped by their racial identity or color, it implies that to truly respect another human being, we must obscure their area of difference. Remember that when we live in the world of our of default bodies, the bodies we imagine when we close our eyes, the default body becomes the template for a normal body. The only reason we would need to erase someone's differences is because we still equate difference to danger or undesirability. When we say we don't see color, what we're actually saying is, I don't wanna see the things that, you, that make you different because society has told me that they are dangerous and undesirable. Ignoring differences does not change our society, nor does it change the experience of non-normative bodies. We must navigate to survive. Rendering difference invisible validates the notion that there are parts of us that should be ignored, hidden, or minimized, leaving in space unspoken ideas that dif and differences is a problem and not our approach to dealing with differences. Proposing that humans are all the same leaves the idea that the body uh, unintegrated in our subconscious and firmly in our place in the world, forcing all other bodies to conform to this rendered invis or rendered invisible. And then an unapologetic inquiry for y'all. Have you ever said any of the following? I don't see color. We're all the same. I don't care if a person is black, white, purple, or whatever. They're playing the race card. Consider this passion and what might you say next time? Um, the book does a really has a really beautiful intersectional lens and dives really deeply into how those different identities show up and what that means for folks. So I'm going to jump to a government for, by, and about bodies. We cannot talk about bodies without talking about the systems that govern our bodies. As you're reading this book, you're probably located in some society with a government. That is, of course, unless you are somehow found a copy of this book in a dark cave in a secret land where only you live, in which case you can ignore this section of this book. The rest of us live under systems of government that are, by their very nature, about rules, laws, and bodies. Allocation of resources, attribution of rights, and assignments of responsibilities in a society are all functions of governance, and they impact the daily lives of the governed, all of whom just happen to be people with bodies. Our systems and structures do not exist in a vacuum. These systems in many ways mirror the societies that made them. They are created and upheld by humans who have the same indoctrinations, beliefs and shame that we all have. Those who govern and, do, and are not immune to the inheritance of body shame, either as recipients or perpetuators. Our leaders must uphold systems of government that directly affect our experiences of body shame and body-based oppression. Officials regularly use the positions of power to codify the belief that already present in our lives, in the lives of their constituents and society at large. The power to create laws also endows governments with the power to influence which bodies we accept as normal and which bodies we do not although the validation of le through the validation of legality. To varying degrees and without very much thought, many of us have accepted that we have been told about our bodies and the bodies of others based on what the government allows, sanctions, ignores, or criminalizes. As, government wielding, as governments wield authority and oversee systems, they're in a unique position to shape how we validate and stratify different bodies. Ultimately, there is a response for creating laws and entities that either protect bodies or oppress them. Again, we either protect bodies or oppress them. Unfortunately, the history of government using its vast influence to ensure that all bodies are treated equitably has been about the consistent game of Russian roulette. Did you know the following? That 76 countries have laws criminalizing homosexuality. In at least five of those countries, the death penalty can be applied to those who are found gay. 
Did you know that immigrants can be deported from New Zealand for having a body mass index of over 35? In Saudi Arabia, states that women should not drive because doing so could lead to the removal of the hijab, interactions with men, or taboo acts. I believe that law was rectified. This book was written I think, two years ago. Um, did you know that in Greece in 2012, a measure allows the police to detain sus suspects of being HIV positive, force them to be tested. The measure also urges landlords to evict tenants who are HIV positive to counter the perceived public health threat. So it was legal in Greece eight years, nine years ago to uh, evict people if you suspected them for having HIV. Le Legasting body shame is not the has been the practice of centuries in bygone. The above laws of modern day examples show how the government um, builds body-based oppression in everyday lives, codifying inequity and injustices for all types of bodies, from the LGBTQIA bodies, to fat bodies, to women bodies, to we live under systems that force us to judge, devalue, and discriminate against the bodies of others. Why you might wonder, have we been so committed to discriminating against various bodies? To answer this question, we must look at the century, the central currency of government power. The Center for American Women in Politics reports that 36% of women, 36% of women held U.S. governorship since the first uh, woman was elected in governor in 1925. So there have only been 36 women in the U.S. government that have held governorship since 1925. By contrast, the United States has been, has, uh, excuse me, has had over 2,300 male governors in its history. Globally, women hold only 23% of total available seats in national parliaments. Considering that women represent approximately half of the human population, it becomes glaringly clear and dis partially that manifestation of gender inequity. Right now, your favorite men's right activist is yelling, these feminists are so dumb. Duh, there are fewer women because women just don't get involved in politics as much as men do. My, my contemplative reply to that might be, I wonder how much of the 140 years of Ameri American women went without having voting rights in Pakistan. Even today in many countries, women must battle laws forbidding or obstructing their involvement in government. Even without the presence of laws, women's involvement in political landscape cannot be separated from the scrutiny, objectification, sexism that they still face while running for the office. All over the world, women must traverse a hostile terrain of question, that questions female uh, suitability for political services while excusing gender discrimination by using outdated, disparaging tropes about female intelligence, ability, and a human as justification for bias. Naomi Wolf, journalist and author of The Beauty Myth, writes, quote, A culture fixated on female thinness is not an obsession about female beauty, but an obsession about female obedience. Dieting is the most potent political sedative in history. A quietly mad population is a, is a tactable one, a tractable one. Unapologetic inquiry number 18. Can you recall an incident where you felt a sense of terror about being in your body? How did you navigate that feeling? Ooh, ooh, <laughs> ooh, I can. Um, all right. The historical and contemporary violence associated with bodies hatred is widespread and horrific. We cannot continue to normalize these actions as simply inconvenient or unfortunate. The outcomes of body terrorism are deadly. From violence against people of color, such as lynching, slavery, the Holocaust, and internment camps, to the LGBTQIA plus bodies being regularly assaulted, murdered, and driven to suicide, to rape and sexual assault, to the bombing of abortion clinics and the murder of physicians based on women's rights, the autonomy over their own bodies, and the involuntary sterilization of people with disabilities to the debilitating shame that people around the world live with the rest of the psychological attacks on social media machines waged against us. It is clear that there is, no, there is nothing rhetorical 
are hyperbolic about dealing with the impacts of body hatred and calling the promotion of such hatred on any scale as an act of body-based terrorism. The framework of radical self-love seeks to engage people on the process of individual transformation. But as importantly, it seeks to dismantle the structural and systemic emotional, psychological, and physical violence meted against different bodies all over the planet. It serves those who profit from our self-hatred to minimize impact and discomfort with the larger social frameworks of, of violence and the intimidation that allows oppression and injustice to thrive. Discrimination, social inequality, and injustice are manifestations of our inability to make peace with the body, our own bodies and others. By making these connections, we build the foundation to foster a world of radical, unapologetic self-love, which translates to radical human action in the service of more than just compassion, a just and compassionate world. How we're doing on time, okay. I got two more passages for y'all. So I'm gonna to skip towards the end of the book. We're in chapter five now. Your radical self-love toolkit. Um, this was the passage that really hit me last night. You are not a car. Some of us, before this whole conversation about radical self-love, didn't so much hate our bodies as we engaged with them like they were vehicles, like a car that we just drove around. We paid only as much attention as we absolutely necessary to get the car started and to get on with our day. We put gas in the car so we didn't end up stuck on the side of the highway or on some back road out of some horror film. We occasionally took the car to the shop if it seemed something was extremely up. Sometimes we trashed the car, littering the passenger seats with wrappers and water bottles. Some of us went for months without visiting a car wash. We would awaken, get in our cars, and go, navigating our lives while giving very little thought to our vehicles until we needed them again. This model is not sustainable. There are some key differences between a car and your body. Primarily, one being that you should wake up and find that your car won't start. You will either, one, buy a new car, or two, find a new means of transportation. Should it be that your body won't start, you can safely assume that you didn't wake up. To treat our bodies like cars is essentially to treat ourselves like something is disposable, like you are disposable. You, my love, are not disposable. Besides, your body wants nothing more than to be your buddy through this ride called life, and that means we need a solid set of tools for the road. All right. I love this part of the book because Sonia goes through all of the different tools, but I'm going to focus to you on tool three, which was my favorite. Um, but before, um, another unapologetic inquiry for y'all to reflect on. Notice the words that you use to describe yourself negatively. Which words do you hear others using as insults? Consider words like fat, crazy, gay, black, or blind. Keep track of how often you casually use those terms. Make a list of some of the body shame-free alternatives. All right. So going into some of the tools that we need. Um, tool number three, reframe your framework. Did you know that your body is not the enemy? Did you? I know how difficult this concept can feel when we feel as though we have been at war with our bodies for our entire existence. This is the case of a friendly fire, folks, and usually we are the shooters. Think back to your last cold or your flu. Chills, fevers, scratchy throat, fatigue, and crusty stuff that builds, you know, awful, right? And if this is our means, it's our, and if this is our mean old body's fault. After all, the body is working overtime to disperse those white blood cells at the site of the virus, attempting to squash its insidious attacks on our immune system. Awful mean old body, right? Wrong. Feeling crappy when you're sick is not a sign of the body that it is mutinating. It's unfortunate that it's the byproduct of our body working exponentially harder to return us to wellness. Our body is fighting on behalf of us as we curse it even though we curse it like a cheating lover. Practice reframing your framework 
can be confounding to those of us navigating chronic illness or gender nonconformity. Feeling trapped in a body that does not feel like it has your best interest at heart assuredly makes sense. It's hard to love a vessel that appears to be the author of significant pain. What a terrifying experience to wake up in a constant pain or in your body that does not feel aligned with who you know yourself to be. It may very well feel like your body is against you. Remember that this, that in this thinking, doing, being, being journey, we will need to be, we need to try on new beliefs and actions in service of radical love. With this tool in mind, we are invited to, uh, invite to ask ourselves, what peace, power, or joy can be gained by deciding that our body that I am inexplicably tied to for the rest of my life is my enemy. If there's no access to peace or power or joy on your current framework, then it simply doesn't serve you. In 2015, an article by the website Exo Jane and the clinical social worker Kai Sheng Tom Pen, what she calls a love letter between women and her body. She challenges the pervasive narrative of being a trans woman born in the wrong body. She writes, quote, I began to see my body not at the cause of hatred directed against me. Society did that. My body did not fail to protect me when I was attacked. I did not deserve that violence. My body was never been wrong. Somebody else decided that, end quote. Kaijing Tom grasped that by trying it on a new framework, it was possible to relate to my body, transform my body from a place of joy instead of a place of fear. Radical self-love asks us to try on new ways of thinking and doing that give us access to new ways of being. Trying on a framework is like trying on a new coat. It may or may not fit. The coat isn't wrong for not fitting. You are not wrong for not fitting the coat. It just doesn't fit. Far too many of us have been walking around the world wearing our my body is my enemy coat, wondering why we feel trapped and miserable. We tried on thinking, we tried on a thinking that doesn't fit our pursuit to radical self-love. Deciding your body is the enemy leaves us fighting an unwinnable battle on our own soil. It all comes down to the simple question. If you decide to be at war with your body, how will you ever know peace? And the last unapologetic inquiry I'm gonna leave y'all with. Consider the ways in which you have been at war with your body. Have you tried to fight your body or make it surrender to your will? Have you shown it animosity? How can you practice radical reconciliation? All right. So that is all that I have for y'all today. Um, I hope some of these things resonated with you. Um, I really love this book because many times it had me stop and reflect like, ooh, ooh, what am I doing? How am I harming myself? Um, yeah, that was a lot. Take a moment to breathe. Take a deep breath with me if you like. I hope, um, again, I hope that some of this stuff resonated with you all. Um, I hope it inspires you to grab a copy of this book. So again, please feel free to hit up the Emily Taylor Center in the DMs. That's the way you can get a copy. Um, if you can't get a copy, um, Sonia Renee Taylor also does a reading of this on Audible. There will be a copy that you can borrow from the Emily, Emily Taylor Center Toni Morrison Library. You can hit up the OMA's uh, pu public library. And then again, we will be offering up a copy to y'all. Um, I hope, again, I hope you can take something from today. I hope you get to celebrate yourselves today in an unapologetic way. Um, and thank you again so much for being with me. Um, tune in, not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. And I believe Dr. Precious Porus will be reading an excerpt. Um, thanks, y'all. Have a great rest of your day.